gather round all ye proud and boastful sons I've been preaching, preaching in the schoolhouse Asking you to raise some building funds Your contributions have been very slow I asked the Lord what I should do Now I have his answer, brethren So I'll shout it out for you Oh, bring along your hand Start in giving before you can get. Gotta start in doing some things you haven't done yet. Bring along the old folks and bring the children too. We'll have a new home in the morning and sing a new song in the morning. We'll have. Ninety-one-three WVKR Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. We'll have a new home in the morning, Matt Monastery. I'm going to do a brief introduction, and then I'm so happy to say Matt's in, stu- in the studio here with me. And let's start off by saying, the Village Voice said, "Wicked jazz musicians aren't supposed to write lyrics that good. Bands like this are why you move to New York." Unquote. Guitarist, singer-songwriter Matt Munisteri has collaborated with many musicians, including Jimmy Scott, Glenn Branca, Bill Frizzell, Madeline Perot, Bucky Pizzarelli, Stephen Bernstein's Millennial Territory Orchestra, Mark O'Connor's Hot Swing, just to name a few. He was on a Grammy winning he was on Grammy winning recordings for Loudon Wainwright and Catherine Russell, and is currently the music director for the acclaimed singer Catherine Russell. He's released several solo works as well. Matt will be performing in the Hudson Valley area at Maureen's Jazz Cellar in Nyack on March 10th and at Lydia's Cafe in Stone Ridge on March 11th. And with that, a warm first-time welcome to Local Motion, Matt Munisteri. Thank you, Rita. You're welcome. Very nice. Yeah. Well, you know. It was fun. Like I said, you're a first time guest. So it was fun doing some homework, (laughs) learning more. As we also said, I did see you for the first time at the Falcon about three years ago. And people Mm -hmm. were saying, you've got to check out this guy. You've got to check him out. So I went and since then have seen you perform with Catherine and also with Stephen at Birdland. I was at that show and also um, here at the Falcon. So I've seen you play a couple of times and getting more of the homework doing your show and listening to youtube videos of you before you sent me the music Uh you've got me hooked oh thank you you've got me hooked what a style what a beautiful style i also like to always say this is your life matt (laughs) monastery so i like to back it up a little bit as far as the start of your life and music and it how it you know came to you i understand you grew up in brooklyn yeah it's funny, you, you asked, you know, for some tunes to play on the air, and so I started listening to stuff, you know, that I've done over the last, like, 25 years, and um, it's crazy. It's kind of all over the place, but I, so I really appreciate you, you know, with the positive words. Because Absolutely. I, I was listening yesterday, and I was like, what have I done for all these decades? It's like, you've made people happy. You've okay. made them <laughs> smile. You've made them enjoy music. And um, the beautiful thing, I play nothing, but I am an avid listener and lover of going to see live music. Yeah. It's my weekly therapy session. Yeah, it's the best. And there's nothing like it there's, because it unites us all, yeah. right? It doesn't, we don't argue when we're listening to music. We're all speaking the same language. Yeah. You travel internationally. It doesn't matter if they're not understanding words you're all together. No, it's incredible. I mean, and there are people like you and like me that really need live music in their life. And so when people, you know, those people show up at your shows and they show up again and again and again, and you're literally performing a, like you're, you're doing a medicinal thing. Mm -hmm. You Mm -hmm. know, you are. Yeah. Yeah. It's like getting your fix. Yeah. Yeah. It really truly is. Yeah. Yeah. So Brooklyn, Italian family, yeah, Italian and Irish. Italian and Irish, lovely. Oh, that's Sicilian sweet. and Irish. Yeah. Oh. It's a very popular 
Brooklyn combination. Brooklyn, Hoboken, these places, you know. I love it. And Musical Mama you had. Yeah, very Musical Mother and uh, Musical Dad, too. My dad loved music, but my mom was kind of a super talent. Um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, I mean, they were big music fans. Talent of vocal talent? talent? great singer, but she could, she had incredible ears, you know, and she could really, like... Um, Many years ago, I was playing a gig with someone, and she said, oh, this, this person, this friend of mine, she was like, she, she hears music the way I do. And I said, yeah, what do you mean by that? And she was like, well, the way you see. So my mother had incredible ears, and she could basically hear anything once and sit down at the piano and play it, even though she hadn't you know, had piano training. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, my brother also has fabulous ears, kind of the same thing. I personally, like, I have to work at it. You know, like, I have a a deep love of music and like you said like a need i actually i have to be making music i have things in my head all the time that you know eventually have to come out but i don't think i have the the natural ears thing that my mother and my brother do um but it was really useful because i could work on learning things off of records and mm -hmm. my mother would walk by the room and say oh no honey the note you're looking for is bop and i'm like oh <laughs> Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Thanks, you know, thanks Mom. Like she could hear the note in a, in a four or five note chord that I was trying to figure out off her record and she knew which note I was getting wrong. You right. know, so I think you and I are about the same age. Um, so pre-internet by decades. Yeah. AM yeah. radio. Yeah, AM radio was, was amazing. Um, I had a little transistor radio and, you know, I mean, you must remember, like, I would just go to sleep and hold the little radio, radio in my head. Radio, yeah, with yeah. the little antenna pointing up. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> but my uh, my folks, you know, because they were big music fans, they would go to, like, the folk festivals. And so that meant, like, the Clearwater Festival. Oh, nice. You know, um, and Croton. Yeah. So, you know, I got to meet Pete Seeger and Fanboy on him when I was, like, eight. Wow. You know? Wow. Um, I'm sure you must have met him. He I was always did, around. But really not until very late. Yeah. Not until very late. Yeah, I met him at the town crier, and he was sitting underneath the big painting that is of Pete Seeger. Yeah. And he come walking by to go to the men's room. I said, Mr. Seeger, I said, it's funny seeing you walk out of the painting. He turned around and he talked to me for a solid 15 minutes about the painting. Hmm. That That's not supposed to be there. This mountain doesn't look like this, <laughs> this and that. And he said, I was much younger when that painting was done. He was, <laughs> I think, 90 at the point. Of wow. when the painting was done, wow. and and it was just lovely. But I had seen him and quickly met him, but that was the most conversation I ever had. Wow, yeah. I was a little kid. I probably when I, I, the time I actually probably really bent his ear or you know got into a real conversation with him. I probably just started playing banjo, so I was like, so cool, like nine probably. And <clears throat> you know, dueling banjos was a top ten hit. It was you know. So your on first the radio. instrument is banjo. Yeah, bluegrass banjo, five Blue, string. It, from Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't, you know, it, was, it wasn't the easiest fitting in in 1970s, you know. Um, what, how, tell, tell us how you started on banjo and why you started on banjo. Well, it, you know, dueling banjos would pop up on the radio probably, like literally, you know, there are a few tunes that would be on the radio five, six, seven times a day, and you mm -hmm. could just turn on your radio and wait for it, and that was one. Um Another one was, uh, you know, that uh, voulez-vous coucher avec moi? You know, me and my brother would just like sit around all day dialing the radio and waiting for that tune to come on. So, you know, you knew that you'd get to get your fix. And uh, I pestered my parents for probably two years to get me banjo lessons. And um, they, they were into folk music, you know, so like it wasn't totally out of the blue, but it did take a long time for them to find someone. And finally they found uh, Jack Baker, at the Fretted Instrument School of Folk Music in, in the village. Amazing. Yeah, Jack Amazing. is still around. We were in touch on really? Facebook a little while ago. Yeah, he was, you know. So right next to Jack was the Folklore Center that is a young ram. And uh, we went in there, and my dad went in. We bought a banjo, and you know, like a beginner banjo, and I started taking lessons with Jack, going into the city once a, once a week. Once a week at, yeah. at a very young age. Did your school have music? Yeah, the, I mean, the public schools in New York City had a lot of incredible music going on, and all the budget cuts started when I was in sixth grade. Mm -hmm. So up till that point, yeah, I'd played in the recorder ensemble and you know, my, in my school, and I'd also played, um, when I got to sixth grade, I was playing upright bass, 
And then New York City did these big budget cuts, and they fired all the um, arts teachers. They fired all the shop teachers, mm. all this stuff. All the necessary things. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, it was like right. it was really that was really a terrible thing. I don't know if we've ever if we've completely rebounded from where we were. You right, know? right, right. But yeah. Jack was great, and um, I'll just tell you quickly. Like I got to, I had a gig about twenty something years ago in northern Sweden, past the Arctic Circle, with a Western swing band, this great band out of New York City called Western Caravan. Um, and we were playing for the gathering of the Sami tribes, who were the indigenous peoples of the Lap, the Laplands. And uh, we were hired because this guy who, who does music for the festival is, is, um, would come to the States, and he happened to walk into the rodeo bar when this band was playing. So I have a day off in Stockholm, and I go into this um, this store because they've got banjos hanging on the wall. And I pick up a book that was like my first banjo book. And I see like, you know, I, I, there's no one in this store. And suddenly this guy comes from the back and he's yelling at me in Swedish. And I was like, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I only speak English. And he's like, oh, American? I was like, yeah. And so we started talking and it was Izzy Young from the Folklore Center, like this sort of epic figure in New York folk history. I don't know if, you know, if he's the guy that like, you know, supposedly gave his back room to Dylan to sit on his typewriter and write his songs. And, and the, here you run into, you have strange so he, things happening to you. I can see There's that a lot in, of weird, yes. circuitous things that happen again and again in my yes. life. But anyway, so we yes. wound up talking and I was like, I bought my first banjo from you, you know. It wound up being a whole evening over at oh, his, wow. his place. Wow, yeah. wow, what a great story. Wow. And then, going back to being a little tyke, yeah. you went to this camp in Long Island. Oh, my God. How did you know that? I do my homework. Wow. Yeah, I went, I went to use Dan yeah, uh -huh. for one summer, and, uh, and you needed to pick an arts major, so I picked guitar. And it was literally like you sat there for two or three hours in the afternoon and just like strummed folk songs. So, you know, by the end of a summer... I'd played through like a hundred songs and learned the chords and stuff. So that was, I was in like fifth grade at that point. Were you still playing banjo that summer yeah, too? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, and then finger picking too. And you, Tony Trishka. I adore Tony Trishka. I've yeah. had him on the show. Yeah. He's been your banjo teacher. Yeah. Tony is a little bit later, but, um, but not much. Yeah, Rita, that's very funny. I hadn't thought about this stuff in a long time. But yeah, I started playing banjo, uh, guitar at that, at that camp. And um, after that, <clears throat> my great aunt, who I was very close with, um, would tell me that if I got good on guitar, she would give me my Uncle John's guitar. And uh, this was, you know, a thing that she, would, she told me for about a year. And I, I started taking cooking lessons from her because I was really into cooking. And she was, a great, she was a great cook. And she had an apartment on New Utrecht Avenue in Brooklyn, right by the elevated train line. So the train line would come literally by her living room window and then come around the kitchen window. So we were in the kitchen cooking, and, you know, the train was always a little bit distracting. And, and I asked about Uncle John's guitar. You know, I remembered my uncle, but he, he died when I was pretty young. And, um, and she was like, all right, I'll go find it. So she went rummaging in the closet and pulled it out. And I opened the case and honestly, I'll never forget the smell from that case. It was like old wood and polish, and it was a 1948 Gibson L7. And so used in that camp got, got me on track, and then I practiced for that whole next year. And uh, so on my, I think it was, I was 12, and uh, on my 12th birthday, she gave it to me. Wow, as, as what a, a gift. Yeah. So that's still, I mean, that was my main guitar till I was like 35, and I still have it. Wow. It's a great guitar. Great yeah. guitar. What a gift. Yeah. Did you, at that age, realize what you were in possession of? Yeah. 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 It, was, it was really, really special. It always had this one nick on it, and my, aunt, my, my great aunt bought it for her husband for his 50th birthday in 1948. Mm. Um, and... <sighs> I remember, you know, he would sing like Sicilian folk music and my family, there was always a lot of, a lot of music on Sunday dinners. You know, my, my aunt played um, piano and she also played some accordion and she sang. My grandmother sang and played piano. My dad was a big lover of opera and singer. So after Sunday dinners in Brooklyn would often be, you know, like gathering around the piano and show oh, tunes wonderful. or Italian music. And yeah. Yeah. What a great way to grow up. Nice memories. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, 
And then high school. What were you listening to? Were you listening to the music you were playing? Oh, I was listening. Yeah, I got into bluegrass and I was like, you know, 10 years old and trying to find Ralph Stanley records. And I mean, I was really like a purist, you know. Um, yeah, I loved like really was no the Led old Zeppelin stuff. for you. No, it was it was kind of <laughs> weird, and it was hard to find those records. I mean, sure. you remember it was like literally like you know you're ten years old, you have to ask your dad, you know, who works in the city, like go to Sam Goody and mm-hmm. look for a Don Reno record for mm-hmm. me. You know, mm-hmm. stuff that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little esoteric. Yeah, a little, a little, a little obscure, but yeah. uh, wonderful. So, high school, did you play out? Did you have bands? Did you? High school, um, I wasn't really playing out. I mean, I played out some, like, you know, occasional rock band stuff towards the end at CB's and the Mud Club and stuff like that. Um, But I started taking banjo lessons from Tony, and I guess that was, you know, I think it came about because there was a great guitar player, Russ Barenberg, who was living in Park Slope where I was growing up. And Russ, I think, had put, like, a a poster out for guitar lessons. And so I started taking guitar lessons from him and I was like, like 12, you know, maybe 13, something like that, probably 12. And, um, Russ was a great bluegrass player and someone I just, I loved his rhythmic thing. I loved his melodies. He's, he's made a bunch of great records and, um, is still playing. So I think Russ might've then put me on to Tony. Um, there's another guy, Marty Cutler that was in the mix and I used to go see, uh, there's a guy, Doug Tuckman, who who died a few years ago, but was um, a concert promoter in New York and would put on these bluegrass shows at the Loeb Student Center. I don't know if you ever heard about this stuff, but in the no. 1970s, I mean, it was unbelievable. Every week was another, like, bluegrass legend, it seemed. It would, you, these concerts would be, like, at least once a month, sometimes twice a month. And I was just a junkie for this stuff, so I got to see everybody. I got wow. to see... Lester Flatt, and I got to see Dom Reno. I got to see the first version of the David Grisman Quintet. All this stuff in person when I was a kid for like whatever, five or ten bucks maybe, right. you know, to get in. Right, right. Um, and you could take the subway there, you know. And th- this series went on for years and years. So I would see Tony play and Russ and um, Bob Jones, Matt Glazer, Kenny Kozik, wow. Citizen Kafka. <laughs> Um, wow. So I'd see these guys who would also open for these bluegrass legends, and I got to see Bill Monroe a bunch of times, and Don Reno, and Ralph Stanley, everybody. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. No better education than that, right? Yeah. I mean, it just gets you hooked. Like, experiencing the live music as mm-hmm. a kid is like, mm-hmm. it's just unbelievable. You know, right. it's so different than than playing a record, you know? So you go to Brown University, but not for music. No. Did you ever, did you say, I want to be, be a musician? Or was that while you were in college afterwards? What, I, mean, I think it was probably always my dirty little secret, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That was what I kind of knew I, I wanted to do. And, and I was playing the whole time I was in college. Um, I was playing more gigs in college than anything Guitar, else. Guitar, banjo, or both? Uh, the first two years, I well, I, I switched pretty much exclusively to guitar by the time I got to college um, because... Um, there was uh, already a banjo player. Uh, this guy, Randy Barrett, who's an old friend, was, was a beautiful banjo player and was playing in a bluegrass band my freshman year. And so they needed someone to play guitar. So I started playing more uh, bluegrass guitar at that point. Um, not necessarily that well, but, you know, they already had a banjo player. And I started singing more in college. and uh, But also, you know, by the end of high school, I wasn't really playing banjo regularly and i've started to go out and hear do you, do you know this band defunct yes yeah and joe joseph Bowie and that whole scene yeah. so that led me to the whole um scene that was happening in new york where like this funk musicians and punk musicians were kind of getting together and there was this whole scene around defunct and james white or james chance and um then that led me to james blood ulmer and uh, so this is a real departure from bluegrass. But right. again, it was just like those were the people that were playing in town. And again, you know, radio like I didn't know about any of this stuff until it was until on I heard it on the radio. Right. You know, and I'd set my alarm clock radio in the morning yep. and they would open. Um, this was like, I think, my senior year in high school. They would open. Uh, they'd play that tune Train to the Plane off the first defunct record. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and. 
that just killed me. And yeah. I, you know, and then you you go out and you get the Village Voice and you turn to the back pages and you see, well, where's this band playing? And I just started going to all those gigs. Wow. And then that led to f- me following Vernon Reed to like whatever kind of gigs I could hear him on, right. which meant Ronald Shannon Jackson and the Decoding Society. Wow. So yeah, by my late teens, it was like there was so much exciting music going on in New York that was out of this kind of free jazz meets funk, this crazy like pop world meets the avant-garde. Right, right. Uh, Composition, when did that start for you? Were you in high school That when you started writing? Yeah, I'd always, even younger, I'd always written, you know, seriously or not, but it was always like music would come out, you know. Um, I was always like hearing melodies and stuff in my head and and even as a little kid like humming or whistling all the time drive my mother insane Uh uh-huh because i thought it was in my head but actually like i was making the noises you You were making the noises show up at my bedroom it was there already um so brown university religious studies major yeah wow (laughs) that wasn't necessarily that i wouldn't advise other people if they were looking (laughs) to be a jazz guitar player i wouldn't advise that path um but yeah, it was, you know, it was interesting. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, I got out of there and basically for a bunch of years, you know, I, I kind of like music was on the back burner when I was in college. And mm-hmm. I certainly wasn't working hard at developing myself as a jazz musician at all. Like I was playing just pop gigs. I was playing a lot of funk gigs. I was playing. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, Prince and Nile Rogers and mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the the. um Parliament Funkadelic guitar players, James Brown guitar players. Like, Good stuff. It's a fantastic yeah. stuff. That, but that's yeah. really where I was in college, like listening to um, that, Sly and the Family Stone, um, and checking out like all those rhythm guitar parts, right. you know. Right. And and then when I got out of school, it was literally like working just any kind of kind of dumb job I could mm-hmm. so that I could find time to practice and buy records and... And, and work on stuff. when you graduated, then you realized I want to pursue music. Yeah. 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 I mean, I already I knew it. It was more that like suddenly there was no one saying you had to go to college. <laughs> what got you to Prague? Oh, my God. Where did you learn this stuff? Um, <laughs> Prague was, uh, well, my ex knew someone that had moved to Prague. This was just literally months after the Velvet Revolution. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I went and uh, so she knew someone that moved to Prague and this person was like, hey, it's super cheap. Like you can live on like like fifty dollars a month. And I knew I needed to practice and I knew I needed to learn a lot of music that I didn't know. And I'd basically been self-taught on the guitar from since I stopped taking bluegrass lessons at like 14 or something like that. And so um, I I knew I needed real time to sit and learn solos and stuff. So, and my, my ex wanted to, um, wanted to write a novel. So we decided, you know, I, I was like 26 and we decided to go, go to Prague. Wow. And, um, spent some time there. Yeah. It was only, it was like four months or something, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it was great because, we were able to go over there with like you know after saving like eight hundred bucks or something and imagine that yeah you and, couldn't even get and by like a week. rent an apartment no I mean it was amazing we had it we had an apartment and I also started going out um, and seeing music in Prague which was really interesting because there were a lot of fabulous musicians there playing like very modern jazz and then there were these musicians playing um, really old New Orleans style traditional jazz um, but as a you know Soviet place like they they sort of missed like the hard bop years they missed bebop they missed all this other stuff um but it was it was a great place to you know i mean you you know you could live on like 75 cents a day you know amazing oh my gosh oh my gosh what an amazing place so you come back from prague and then then i started sitting in in places in the city you know, like I, you felt like, OK, I practice. I feel good about playing. out. I've been I'm, working at it for years, but Prague was kind of like I brought over a lot of like I brought cassette tapes with like mm-hmm. Clifford Brown solos and Charlie Parker solos and Sonny Rollins solos. Those wow. were the three that wow. really just I wanted to learn. And I, I mean, you know, 
I'm lazy and like I, I, I got down certain things, but I'm not one of those guys that like ever learned how to play full solos at tempo. I would just listen to this stuff and pick up um, bits and pieces. I'd hear something over, you know, these two bars, these four bars, or the head is great, and then I'd learn it off those cassette tapes. And so you come back and you start sitting in, and obviously um, it led you to many different places. Do you remember your first recording session? I, yeah, but I don't remember who it was with. I remember <laughs> the I remember the place it was. It was a studio on Broadway and um, Houston Street, but I don't remember the name of the band leader. This is pathetic, right? It wasn't that <laughs> long ago. Um, but, you know, that was, I mean, other than that, like in college and stuff, there were little recording sessions, but that was the first where like someone, you know, gave me a little money. Right. Um, you know, I mean, it all just sort of started to happen um, by the time I was about 30, you know. So in, in jazz world, like, that's quite late. Uh-huh. And the people that I was sitting in with were other students, but they were, you know, some of my best friends were still, like, 8 to 10 years younger than me. Uh-huh. You know, those were the people that I was meeting. Right. Um, it was very, you know, my 20s, Rita, were are kind of a blur only because I was figuring my your path my out. path out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um and but that's what 20s are for around. yeah but a lot of people i mean most of the people i play with i would say are, were much more focused on music much earlier mm-hmm. and uh and it shows i mean <laughs> like i'll tell you the one the one thing that i would recommend to anyone whether they're in their 20s or 30s or teens or whatever who wants to start playing with people um get your get your accompanying skills together and get your rhythm playing together. And that was the one good thing is that I, I, because I'd sat and learned all these James Brown guitar parts, because I'd learned all these P funk guitar parts and prints. Um, I was playing all this rhythm and that meant that, you know, even if my soloing wasn't that good, like I wasn't hurting the overall sound of the band, hopefully, you know, right, when right. I play. So I could sit in and like kind of hold my own. I remember doing something, um, I you know, that sort of like launched people suddenly calling me for gigs. I was on a jam session and I played a solo and everyone was like, oh man, that was incredible. Take another course. And I played like course after course. And I remember I was playing in the key of E and everyone was like, whoa. And, uh, and then I got off stage and was listening to the band and I realized they'd been playing in B flat. <laughs> So I played like this whole thing in E and, and that was, you know, like playing kind of outside and, and that just was enough. The people started like literally after that session, I started getting phone calls. So it was just an incredibly stupid accident. But, you know, <laughs> but it's great that it works like that. I mean, you every know. once in a while. Yeah. Wow. If it doesn't get you tossed off the bandstand, it'll get people asking for your number. Absolutely. Absolutely. You've worked with some amazing, not just guitarists, but all kinds of different people. Um and who you're working with now, I adore as well. Um, when do you remember, like, first going out on tour? Yeah. So the first, when I was like 30 or 31, I started, I heard about this band, The Flying Neutrinos, mm-hmm. from my friend Andrew Hall, who's a fine bass player in town. And, um, and he said, yeah, they kind of do like New Orleans and kind of older jazz. And I'd been like quietly listening to mm-hmm. all this swing from the from the 30s and 40s, um, and I'd always really loved it. But more and more, and again, radio WBGO, mm-hmm. I listen you know, to it all the time. Yeah, I mean, so BGO started playing Scott Hamilton, mm-hmm. who's a great tenor player, mm-hmm. but a contemporary tenor player in the 1980s. You know, I mean, he's contemporary now, but he was like a young man making these records that sounded like 1940s and 30s stuff. Yeah. And um, Scott had two guitarists on the records. I went to Tower Records as soon as I heard the stuff on the radio and went and bought the records. And uh, Howard Alden and Chris Flory. And both those guys, but Howard in particular, was playing with like no reverb, no effects, and just this clear swinging sound. So I'd been kind of like more and more having my ear pulled in that direction. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So he told me about this band, The Flying Neutrinos, and I was like, man, that sounds like exactly what I want to play with. I, that's exactly what I want to do. And he said, well, they need a guitar player. Like, their guitar player just quit. So I said, can you just please just put my <laughs> name in? Like, you know, so right. he got me on, like, 
some gig coming down and playing with them. And that led to me joining the band, which led to then us going on the road. So that was, um, you know, like three or four years that I was playing in that band. Awesome. And we wound up actually signing to um, MCA and uh, making a record that Tommy LaPuma produced. And by that point, I was writing a lot of music for the band. So this is in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And again, pre-internet, one of the great things about going on the road is that, like, you have record stores yeah. local record stores yeah. at your disposal and local guitar stores and all this stuff. So fun, right? Yeah. So you get to musician. LA, you yeah. get to Texas, you get to Louisiana, all these places with like the music you love yeah. and you get to buy the records yeah. that you can't find. In that New you York. can't find anywhere. Yeah. yeah. I was just down in New Orleans for, for Thanksgiving, my oh, first time. You. And yeah. I love the music. Like I listen to OZ I can't all the time. Your first time. Wow. I can't either. Yeah. I can't either. And my friend lives down there. He's a DJ on OZ, yeah. WWOZ. And he's like, go here, go. So I followed exactly where he told me to go and yeah oh my god and louisiana louisiana music louisiana factory music factory unbelievable one of the greatest record stores in the world yeah incredible i you know it was just oh my gosh yes yeah, yeah. no it won't be my last time down there no the first time i went to new orleans was in probably like 96 <clears throat> and um i remember screaming as we were driving across the bayous on our way to to new orleans because the air just felt yeah. so incredible. Yeah. Like the humidity and the heat, and it was, there was a heaviness and a funkiness. And, um, and then I got out of the car when we parked in the French Quarter, and I started hearing the accent, and I was like, you know, this is really kind of like a Brooklyn thing. Like, it's really <laughs> funny. It's not like an like a Atlantic Coast mm -hmm. Southern thing, you know? It's their own thing. I got out of the, in the airport. Yeah picking up my bag and there's a brass band playing in the airport that's live crazy. i'm like uh, that's it I, yeah. I may never like return back it, yeah what in the airport yeah the i airport. mean there's so few places in the in the u.s where music live music playing it and mm -hmm. listening to it is a part of people's daily lives mm -hmm. like a part of their weekly rituals yeah, I wanted to go not to Jazz Fest or Mardi Gras or any. I just wanted to go when it was locals. Like, yeah. what do the locals listen to? What are yeah. they doing? And that's all I wanted to do for my first visit down yeah. there. So, whew. anyway. Yeah. yeah, my first visit, Frenchman Street was just yes. starting to happen. Mm -hmm. And there was a club there. Oh, my God. What is it? What was the name of it? Club Brazil, I think. Cafe, Cafe Brazil. Cafe Brazil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we played there on my birthday. I think it was like my 32nd birthday. Wow. And that was just the greatest night of my life. Oh. Like I was like, I'm, I just felt so great. Right. I'll right. never forget like that feeling, like turning the amp up. It's just, yeah. Yeah. It really is like a really special thing. And Frenchman street, I, I stayed there and um, right around the corner from there. And it was so intimate, like one after the other, after the other. And the doors were opening. You, you it was, you know, I felt so alive. Yeah. I, I just, you know, you'd leave one great show to go see another great show, to go see another. Yeah. And it was, I was in my, I mean, I said to my 22-year-old my daughter, who's a violinist, I said, I think this is what heaven is going to look like if there is such a thing. And if I get there, this is what heaven's going to be for me. Yeah, it, it is incredible. Yeah. We, yeah. we stayed upstairs from the Palm Court and... uh I remember Benny Waters and Doc Cheatham were playing. So so at night we would go down and sit in and play, you know, a set with those guys who were I think maybe I don't remember Benny Benny Waters was definitely in his 90s, a sax player. All right. Um yeah, it's it's an amazing place. It really is. But there there's so little. It's still alive in Texas. Mm -hmm. Like Texas has the Texas dance hall traditions. Mm -hmm. Um New Orleans. I think there's still a thing in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know, with Chicago blues, that's still like people really go out and, and see and the see music. It. Right. But there's nothing like New Orleans as far as it being integrated into people's just weekly rituals right. of their lives. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I saw that when I was down there. I also, because I want to get moving on to all this other lo new stuff that you're doing, but we have to talk about your guitar. Oh, okay. Which because guitar? the 1920 Master. Oh yeah, yeah. Model the, L five. Yeah. Serial number eight five nine seven eight. Just in case it gets stolen, I'm glad it's here on the radio. 
<laughs> or I can do this next time I come through and they think that I bought it someplace when I come through customs. Um, yeah, that that guitar is a yeah, that it's a fabulous guitar. I I played um, a 1920s L5. Maybe at some point, yeah, in the in the nineties, in the mid to late nineties, um, my friend Larry Wexer, who's a dealer in New York, would get these things, and um, <clears throat> he kind of made me understand like how special those nineteen twenties ones are. They're a little smaller body; they're really sweet, but they can be loud, but they can also be like really rich sounding and delicate, almost classical. Um, that's the guitar I was playing on New Home in the Morning. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I, I got that one in 2000, um, and I just joined um, Vince Stradano's band. Uh-huh. Do you know, have you seen Vince? I have not seen Hawks? him. Vince is an amazing person. Um, I hesitate to call him a person because he's kind of a force of nature. <laughs> he uh, mm-hmm. He's had, you know, this band, I think, since he was a, I think he started it, or at least started the beginnings of it when he was a teenager. And it does 1920s and 30s music, like, exactly like the records. Wow. They'll transcribe solos, they'll transcribe exact arrangements, mm-hmm. or he'll do stock arrangements, you know, the, the exact arrangements from the 1920s. And with the period instruments and the best players in New York doing this stuff. Right. Uh, it's a great band, and they usually play out um, once or twice a week. And anyone in New York, it's, a, it's an institution. Wow. Where do they Hawks. play? Right now, I know they were doing a residency in Birdland that mm-hmm. might still be going on at the mm-hmm. Birdland Theater. Mm-hmm. Um, they might be between regular weekly gigs, but when I joined the band, they were playing at a place called the Cajun on Eighth Avenue that's since gone. Um, and so, yeah, I bought that guitar, and um, that became kind of my acoustic voice. That was a that's a great instrument. I still play it all the time. All the time. Yeah, I think when I see you, when I've seen you, the four or five times I've seen you, I think that's maybe the guitar. Probably not actually, Rita. It's probably no? yeah, because I'm probably playing plugged in, in which case it's yes. a guitar that looks exactly like okay. that. Okay. Okay. But it's a uh, it's an old um, um, ES150 for the guitar nerds out there that has mm-hmm. a Charlie Christian pickup, a 1940 ES150. How many guitars do you have, Matt? Not as many as I did. Uh-huh. I, I left New York uh, almost five years ago. I left the city mm-hmm. and moved to the beautiful Hudson Valley. And uh, I sold a lot of guitars so that I could um, put a roof on this house that we were buying. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I don't know how many I have. Probably somewhere around eight or uh-huh. 12, something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Seven, mm-hmm. 13. How'd something? you find the Hudson Valley? Um. You know what? Actually, I found it because my mom got in an accident in the late 90s and uh, wound up in the hospital in Kingston. Mm -hmm. And I went up and um, would go to, you know, be with her in the hospital every day for about a week until we were able to move her to a place in the city when she got discharged from the hospital. And um, I just thought Kingston was the best. Mm -hmm. And this was in the late 90s. And I was like, I would go to the, there was a little bar next to the hospital and it was just old guys sitting in there drinking whiskey and beer and eating tins of sardines. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is it. This is it. Yeah. 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 No, it's cool. It's a, it's an amazing area. You, yeah. You see now that you're part of it here. The musicians that live here is. There's all kinds of people tucked into the woods. All kinds. Yeah. And, all kinds. Yeah. And yeah. great legends and great people that you might not have ever heard right. I, i'm disappointed i never got to um meet eddie deal did you mm. know him when he was I, here i i saw him at the falcon okay and he was here right here in poughkeepsie as a yeah. matter of fact not far from this campus where yeah. we are broadcasting um a fabulous player yes and luthier yep mm-hmm. yep mm-hmm. yeah just at the falcon just met him at the falcon and uh yeah, yeah, that was really good. I, I saw so many people at the Falcon. I, I, I think you for the first time too. When it, did the Falcon open? Uh, we're in tw- two thousand nine. Okay, yeah. Uh, but he had Tony had the original Falcon behind his house in oh, right, the barn. That was in the barn, the right? Where it was series. by invite and a pot lo- a potluck series, right? And then it got so big that he's like, let's buy this building and put it where it is today yeah, yeah so yeah it's a treasure it's there's no place you play it's all amazing. over the world um there's no place like the falcon no i want to come back i played there i think the first time with Catherine. Mm-hmm. it was a bunch of years ago um 
Talk but it's about amazing. Catherine. And Tony was such an incredible. I was like, she, she's, I, I, I'm mesmerized by her on stage. She's captivating. She's real. She's just a love. She's she, the best. Really? How did you get connected with her? Because now you're like her musical director. You're about to go to hit a couple of shows with her. How yeah. did you meet the lovely Catherine Russell? Well, okay. So I'll speed speed through a couple of things. <laughs> um, after the Flying Neutrinos, which ended uh, like 2000, like literally January 1st, 2000 was the last time I played with them. Um, uh, I started freelancing around the city and getting called for, I, I was, my phone was ringing. I mean, even when I was in the neutrinos, I was working. That was the time like when I was working every night in town and often doubles or sometimes triples, you know, wow. it was busy and, um, <clears throat> and doing recording sessions and stuff. And then, so then I was like freelancing for a bunch of years and, um, I guess I heard about Catherine in probably like 2000 four or five maybe 2005 i'd heard about her that she was starting to do like kind of swing and stuff and i heard about her because a friend of mine rochelle garnier um who's a fabulous songwriter and great musician um uh mentioned that um her friend Catherine was singing she's and i said oh who's this and she said she's the greatest singer in the world and i was like oh really and she said no she's she's the greatest singer i've ever heard and i was like okay um, and she started telling me about her and said that she also plays bluegrass mandolin. She was like, you should meet her. She plays mandolin. And I was like, that's crazy. And I started thinking about it and I was like, wait a minute, what does she look like? And she described her and said she was, you know, kind of on the short side and stuff and black. And I was like, she has to be this woman that I played with at this bluegrass festival when I was 17. So this is not, <laughs> this is not part of Catherine's like, kind of narrative of her of her career generally be, because she's worked with all these major pop stars and she has her own bands and she's a fabulous performer and singer but she went through this period of playing like string band music and wow. stuff and I was a teenager and it was a parking lot f festival but I'm pretty sure it was Catherine I remember her I remember exactly what she looked like and I remember that I had never heard singing like this in my life and isn't that something I thought about her for then 20 something years like I'm not joking I literally I was like Goosebumps. every once in a while I'd be like whatever happened to that woman who was this incredible singer so anyway about a year after this after I hear about her she calls me to do a gig and I think she called me because she'd seen me play with Rochelle mm -hmm. um, I think she she came to a gig um, with Rochelle and uh, Jenny Scheiman a violin player the three of us would do trio gigs often so that led to me playing with her in probably like 2006 7 something wow. like that i think mm. i think 2006 um i don't know but did anyway, you say i saw you when you were i waited about a year to tell her because it's a little <laughs> creepy and she didn't believe me for a long time uh -huh. i think she might believe me now uh i can't swear we kind of dropped the conversation but, um but anyway, yeah, she's the best, and she's she's a fabulous um, performer and a great singer. She's also a prose pro, mm -hmm. and I've learned so much from her over the years about just every aspect of showbiz. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. both she and I come from families with showbiz, but hers is really pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. Her mother was a great bassist, singer, pianist, and her dad. And her dad was one of the like literally one of the people who was there making music at Jazz's founding right. and had a huge influence. His band influenced musicians. He he started the careers of a lot of musicians and worked with Louis Armstrong for years. So, yeah, I mean, you know, and in my family, my mother was a, was a television writer and hmm. her father was worked in radio and my great-grandparents were, um, were vaudevillian performers. Wow. Comedian and magician. Wow, and, it's um, in your blood. Wow. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, there's a there's the art of what we do, and then there's the showbiz aspect of, like, showing up mm -hmm. and being prepared mm -hmm. and um, delivering the goods mm -hmm. and remembering that, you know, you're, you're performing this alchemy. You're making this thing happen for this audience and for this, like, interaction where you're bringing something to the music. Every time I've seen her, I feel like I'm in her living room mm -hmm. and she's invited us all in and it just feels so intimate and just so special. Catherine spent a long time um, 
making developing herself so that she can perform that magic you know mm-hmm. so she studied theater mm-hmm. she has that background mm-hmm. and that com- that comes with a vocal training it comes with a certain ability to inhabit your body and really own the stage yeah. and the spotlight for a little lady she's got one hell of a stage presence yeah, i she's mean incredible. she's a powerhouse yeah. and um, and i'm happy to say to listeners that we are talking to Matt Monastery who's the musical director for Catherine Russell and you guys are going to be at Birdland in New York yeah. February 14th through the 18th yeah we're also going to be in Pauling, I guess. Yes, at, at the, the Pauling concert series on March 31st. Yeah. So you'll be doing that. Yeah. And all this info is on your website, mattmunisteri.com. And talk about something that you have coming up. I found this out and I thought it's so cool. So the Ear Inn, yeah. which I unfortunately, I've never been to, but it's the oldest inn in the city, right? It's, it's I think it's the oldest watering hole, like the, only, yeah. like the oldest continuous bar. Even older than McSorley's? Yeah, I think so. I think it goes back to, you know, the late, it might go back to the, well, the early 1800s, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah, I mean, the ear is this place. A teacher of mine, just another one of these like full circle things, a teacher of mine in high school lived around the corner from the ear. Back in the 80s, the early 80s, this is like 81, 82, when those were all giant lofts and it would be, and he was a musician and it would just be, it was just a bunch of guys in a loft on the fourth or fifth floor. You'd have to yell upstairs and they'd throw the key out in a sock, you know? I love it. And so I would go over there and we'd play guitar and we'd play ping pong and then we'd wind up um, at the ear. And this is also drinking age was 18. Mm-hmm. So if you were 16 or 17 in the city, like, you got you away with just it. Go out to yeah. bars, you know? Right. Um, and I think the ear in was the first place that I went where I was like, you know, maybe being an adult wouldn't be terrible because it seemed like kind of a nice hang. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, John Kelso, who's a great friend and just an extraordinary trumpet player, um, and I started this gig there 15 years ago um, when the Cajun, that place that we were playing with Vince Giordano, closed. And um, it's every Sunday night, and it's a quartet that's just an acoustic quartet I play plugged into an amp, but you know, there's no amplification or anything and it's two horns, bass and guitar. And it's a rotating cast of characters. I make it whenever I can, but if I'm not there, it's always a great sub. Um, it's, it's often Chris Flory or James Torillo, uh, or Joe Cohn or, uh, Josh Dunn, a young guitarist who's, um, been a friend and, and showed up on my doorstep for lessons one time, like almost 10 years ago. Um, And um, so, yeah, it's a great, and the best horn players doing this stuff in the city. So you're doing a recording there. Yeah, so we're recording this coming Sunday, and we recorded two Sundays ago. And we're doing this, yeah, we're doing this record live from the ear. It's been fun. You're also going to be up at the Egg with John Pizzarelli, yeah. Radio Deluxe Live. Yeah, next next uh, the fourth Saturday, the yeah, fourth, the yeah. fourth, yeah, 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 and then Birdland with Catherine Russell, uh, Maureen's Jazz Cellar. Like you say, you don't do a lot of local shows. So yeah, I this mean, is it's a time kind when of... like I'm actually doing local stuff, which is great. Great. Yeah, um, Maureen's is a uh, is a place in Nyack owned by Dave Budway, who's a spectacular musician. Budway's a great piano player and a great singer and entertainer, and he's opened this club, uh, Maureen's Jazz Cellar. And uh, so I'm playing there on March March 10th 10th with Ben Porowski, um, who's a great friend and just amazing musician, and um, Joe Barbado on accordion and piano, and Danton Bowler. um, And Danton's... Ah. Danton, Joe, and Ben are some of my closest friends, so, Ah. you know, playing with them is great. Yeah, And then we're playing the next night... In Stone Ridge at, at Lydia's. Lydia's. I, I don't know Lydia's, but um, I'm looking forward to yeah. being there. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Wonderful. And then, of course, Catherine Russell again, Pauling Concert Series. Again, listeners, mattmunistery.com. You also have some social media and all of that good stuff. Let yeah. me spell the last name. M-U-N-I-S-T-E-R-Y. R-I. 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 I have it written down as I. I know. Mattmunistery.com. Um Yeah. Now, when you get a chance to see you, people definitely should. We have to talk because my guest next week is Stephen Bernstein and MTO you've been with for decades. Um, Talk about your connection to Stephen Bernstein. So 
you're I, smiling. <laughs> well, in the in the 1980s, I used to go out to the knitting factory, the mm-hmm. old knit. And nowadays, when I say the old knit, people think like, oh, Leonard Street. I'm like, no, no, no. I mean like on Houston Street, um, upstairs, when it was just upstairs. Then they started the downstairs thing too. Um, <clears throat> and every night of the week was like incredible avant-garde music that brought together I mean New York it's the stuff that I was talking about when I said I used to go out and see James Blood Ulmer and all this stuff Um, but I would see Bernstein and different bands and I was a huge Lounge lounge Lizards fan when I was in college Um, so I knew who Stephen was and I knew who Porowski was and all these guys but then I guess Stephen called me because um, Michael Blake who's a good friend and a great tenor player and I think Marcus Rojas also. I played with both of them, and they, I think, mentioned me to Steven. So he called me to sub for my friend Doug Womble in the band. And that was probably in, like, 2002. So literally, I think it's been, like, 20 years, wow. which is insane. Wow. Because it really has flown by. Yeah. Um, but Steven is one of these guys, you know, Steven's a macher, if I can use the term as mm-hmm. an Italian-Irish guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's someone that just puts together people and puts yeah. together concepts and, and he knows he's he's got this brilliant mind for arranging and yep. for just hearing it in his own head and yeah it's, and taking all kinds of disparate yeah. elements and bringing them together and, and gathering all, friends of his and to also released some new music and Catherine russell also did some vocals on some of that yeah so it is all connected mm-hmm. um so you know i've made uh maybe six records with steven um and three of them came out last year <clears throat> Stephen put out three records, uh, or four, I don't know, but at least, Stephen's going to hate me for this, but I don't know, I don't know how many of this, he just put <laughs> no, out too much. He'll tell I think us at next least, week. I think at least two uh-huh. um, are versions of the Millennial Territory Orchestra. Um, one is kind of a, a, a an offshoot of that that featured Henry Butler, and Henry died. Yes. Henry was a spectacular, yeah. amazing New Orleans-based musician, pianist, who's music and style encompassed you know everything from the teens through the mm-hmm. years that haven't even happened 21st century like <laughs> right. Stephen uh, you know Stephen started working with Henry um maybe a dozen years ago um I don't remember when uh but Henry was incredible so I worked with Stephen and the band he had with Henry and with uh, a little project that he put together with Bernie Worrell and Vernon Reed doing and other guests doing the music of sly stone wow but yeah last year he put out he put out uh three records and Catherine is the singer on one of them yes the yeah. record that was music that he was writing arrangements for with henry mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um i think that one's called um well i don't know rita maybe you have it in front of you i don't have it in front of me community good time people good time i think the whole project is community music maybe that's right. good time music right or i can't remember i can't remember but i I've, I've played a couple of them talk to me cuz the time's almost up here it's actually over but it's too interesting to stop um about the music that you sent me every time i have an artist on and someone like you that has a musical career for decades the hardest thing they have to do is pick four tracks for me to play. Okay, so tell us I, about what you said. I included one tune of mine called "The Signifying Rag," that from a live in Italy recording that we did that hasn't been released. This is from I think two thousand five. Wow. Um, I almost I wanted to send you something else that's kind of crazy, but you can play it another time. Um, what else did I send you, Rita? Tell me the title. I'm in the mood for love. Oh yeah, yeah. So I wanted to send one with Catherine. This is a nice track that features Joe Barbado on the accordion, also who's going to be playing with me um, at both Maureen's and at Lydia's. Um, and I sent you "New Home in the Morning" that also features Ben Porowski on drums. Which oh we yes, which we played. Yeah. And Brian's bounce. And Brian's bounce is from the first recordings that I did as a leader. This is from like '98 or '99, and it's with John Kelso on trumpet oh. and Will Holshauser on accordion. Matt, um, amazing, all of it. All it's of just it. a it's a mix of stuff. the the record The new home in the morning was a record that I put out a few years ago of the music of Willard Robeson, who was a 1920s and 30s songwriter, and we can talk about that another time, but. I need I'll come you back, back when here. I do when I do volume two of the Willard. Please, record. please. You see how quick it, this goes. It's amazing. Well, I can chatter. Well, that's a, that's what we're do, supposed to do. You yeah. know, It'd be pretty boring to have radio with just 
dead air. Yeah. So this is what we need to do. Matt, I'm going to um, just say thank you for taking the time thank out you. of your day thank you. to come here in person. And um, it, there's nothing that beats it, like we were saying, because we've all been through hell the last couple of years with isolation. Yeah. And just a change of the way we do everything we know. So it's just nice to have an in-studio guest that I'm looking at in the eye. Mm -hmm. And um, your music is elegant. It's eloquent. It is... it. I love that kind of style. So you've captured me from the first time I saw you at the Falcon. And every time I knew you were on something, I would try to go in. And before I like, I didn't introduce myself to you. I, I just sat back because you sometimes just sit there and you're very like inconspicuous, but boy, when you play, Thanks, it man. is really, you're just a, really, thank you. Thank you for the music. Thank, thank you, you for it's great being here. doing what you do with yeah. um, making people happy because after a show, that's what you do. And people well, come up to you. we get happy when people show up. Yeah, so. yeah. So we need people to show up. And, you know, Maureen's is a small club. So I think that um, isn't going to be a problem. I don't think any of these. Um, and if you want to take a ride to Birdland to see Catherine Russell with We'll Matt, be there all week. Valentine's all week. week yeah. yeah, the 14th and through the 18th. That's also a great band. She's going to have different special guests every Every night. I might have to take a trip into the city. For yeah. That. Come, yeah. Easy. And uh, Maureen's Jazz Cellar in Nyack on March 10th with Matt. And Matt will also be at Lydia's Cafe in Stone Ridge on March 11. And then again in Pauling with Catherine Russell, March 31 at the with the uh, Pauling Concert Series. Matt's website, mattmoonistery.com. I'm going to play I'm in the Mood for Love. Thanks, right. Rita. Thank you, Matt. Okay. All right. Let's get this uh, potted up here. All right. <laughs>
913 WVKR Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York, broadcasting live from the beautiful campus here at Vassar College. Thank you again to Matt Munisteri for being my guest today. If you missed part or all of that interview, I will be uploading it tonight to the local motion page as well as the YouTube channel. If you please would consider subscribing to Local Motion on 91.3 WVKR. That would be so kind of you. And give a follow by the same name on YouTube. Sorry, I'm out of breath because I ran to the elevator to get Matt where he needed to go. And um, I just ran back in here. So I'm going to play one more track from Matt's music. And then we'll play some at the end of this hour. So one more for from Matt. And this one is called... Brian's Bounce. Matt Munisteri here on 91.3 WVKR, Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie.
91.3 WVKR, Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. Matt Munisteri, the track called Brian's Bounce. You can check out more about Matt on his website, mattmunisteri.com. And go to see him live. Yeah, lots of good stuff happening there. Um And thank you again to Matt. It's so nice to have an in-studio guest. Most of the time lately, people have been calling in because of the pandemic, right? And all of that. So it's just now nice when people are in studio. So it was really cool to have him come down. And um, yeah. So we start off every hour here on the show that we don't have a guest by paying tribute to Tony Falco from the Falcon in Marlboro, who passed away October 28th of 2021. He um, had a really cool playlist. And um, so I pick a track from that playlist every single show. And it's in order, like the numbers that he put it in. And, um, and there's a couple hundred tracks there. So I do this just to spend a few minutes to reflect about Tony, all the beautiful things he's done with his life and the legacy that he left at the Falcon, which is now being run by his son, Lee Falco. So let's start off this hour with a track for Tony. And this is off his playlist. You'll recognize it. Let's take a listen to Rod Stewart, 91.3. She claimed that it just ain't natural She took me off from deck and 
Trifecta right there. 91.3 WVKR Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. Jay Collins, his new single called Porch Light Blues. And that was recorded at Beat Recording Studios in Catskill by Manuel Quintana and produced by Manuel and Jay and mixed by Danny Bloom and Manuel Quintana. This features Scott Gerard on slide guitar and the rest of the Northern Resistance Band, which of course is Jay Collins on vocals, keyboard and tenor sax, Manuel Quintana on drums and percussion, Peter Dugan on acoustic and electric guitar, Jeremy Baum on organ and Kyle Esposito on bass. And Jay Collins will be performing this Friday up in Woodstock at Colony. Tickets available at colonywoodstock.com to see Jay Collins. Jay Collins, a longtime member of Levon Helm's Midnight Ramble Band, still member of the Midnight Ramble Band. He's played extensively and for dec- for about a decade or more with Greg Allman and... Um, yeah, lives right here in the Hudson Valley. He's also been touring with Little Feet a little bit and a whole bunch of other great people. Jay Collins. Again, colonywoodstock.com for tickets to go check him out Friday night. We also heard music from the new album by The Weight Band called Shines Like Gold. We heard Brian Mitchell singing Old John. Brian Mitchell was last week's guest here on Local Motion. And... Um, the weight band will be performing this weekend, Saturday to be exact, at Levon Helm Studios in Woodstock. I believe there might still be a few tickets at available. You can check out levonhelm.com to see if that in case is the fact. And we started off the hour with music by paying tribute to Tony Falco. From his playlist, we heard Every Picture Tells a Story by good old Rod Stewart. That was the title track of that album by Rod Stewart. All right, so I'm Rita Ryan. I'm here each and every Wednesday with you from 4 to 6 p.m. The show Local Motion on 91.3 WVKR broadcasts live each Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. And it features music of the Hudson Valley. So we talk to musicians that live here, those that come to perform in our venues, as well as those coming to record in our world-class area recording studios. Thank you again to today's guest, Matt Munisteri. That was so much fun. So much fun. Such a nice guy. And oh, what a talent. MattMoonistery.com. You can also go see him perform live uh, coming up. He doesn't perform around here all that often. He is going to be at uh, Maureen's Jazz Cellar in Nyack on the 10th of March. And he'll be at Lydia's Cafe in Stone Ridge on March 11th. Then with... um, Catherine Russell at Birdland from February 14th through the 18th. John Pizzarelli Radio Deluxe up at the Egg next week on the 4th. And with Catherine Russell again, March 31st with the Pauling Concert Series. And MattMonastery.com. Just keep following him on socials and go treat yourself and see him perform live when you can. 
All right, so these guys that we're going to play now are playing some anniversary show. They've been together quite a few years. Mr. Roper will be at Colony in Woodstock on Sunday. Let's take a listen to him right here, right now on 91.3.
There's a bright side somewhere There's a bright side somewhere Let's not rest until we find it There's a bright side somewhere There's more joy somewhere There's more joy somewhere Let's not rest until There's a bright side somewhere There's 
a bright side somewhere. 91.3 WVKR, another Hudson Valley legend that is. Happy Traum, his new album, There's a Bright Side Somewhere. We heard the title track from that. And Happy's liner notes in the CD say, I learned this from excellent guitarist and singer Mary Flower several years ago. Its simple, positive message immediately struck a chord with me, and I've been singing it and playing it since. Happy is joined by Larry Campbell on mandolin, Zach DeJakian, Eugene Ruffalo, and Amy Helm on vocals on this wonderful 13-track CD, happytraum.com. We also heard Dylan Doyle from his album, Pleasures of the Damned. We heard Unify, and Dylan Doyle will be performing this Friday down in Beacon, uh, right on Main Street at Town Crier Cafe, the legendary Town Crier. And tickets available at towncrier.com. And that's town spelled with an E, crier.com, to check out Dylan Doyle this weekend. And we heard Mr. Roper, their self-titled release, Sit Down Katie. Those guys will be performing at Colony in Woodstock this coming Sunday. It's an anniversary show. Mr. Roper is with Rick Schneider and Eric Squindo. And they're a lot of fun and great musicians. And um, yeah, I'm sure they'll be having lots of other people join them as well. Again, Mr. Roper this Sunday in Woodstock, colonywoodstock.com for tickets and info to that show Sunday evening. And this wonderful lady that we're going to play now just released her latest release, and it's called Celeste, it's hard saying this, it's a tongue twister, Celestial. Strangers. It's a new instrumental album by the lovely and talented Ms. Sarah Fim. Let's take a listen to her right here, right now on 91.3. Thank you. 
91.3 WVKR Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. Stephen Bernstein's group, Sex Mob. The album, Cinema, Circus, and Spaghetti. Sex Mob plays Fellini, the music of Nino Rota. And we just heard the track, Nadia Gray. I play this for many reasons. A, it's really cool. And B, Stephen Bernstein will be my guest here on Local Motion next week. Don't want to miss that, guys. Really phenomenal. And, um... It's time for musical happenings because we're nearing the end of our time. And I do this every show towards the end of the show in alphabetical order, list some of our area venues. And we've got some real great ones um, in the hopes that you go support live music and that you go support the musicians and the venues and the whole music industry here in the Hudson Valley, because we really are blessed and lucky to have so many great venues. Let's start it off with the Bardavon and UPAC. Bardavon.org, March 1, Sean Colvin, Mark Cohen, Sarah Jaros. April 15, Natalie Merchant. Bearsville Theater in Woodstock, also bearsvilletheater.com. February 8, Angel Olsen and the Big Time Band. March 3, Talking Heads tribute with Start Making Sense. Caramore in Katona, New York. Info at caramore.org. February 12, Chamber Music with Avalis Quartet. March 24, Sean Mason Quintet. City Winery, Hudson Valley in Montgomery, New York. Info at citywinery.com. February 2, Anders Osborne. Colony in Woodstock and ColonyWoodstock.com. Tonight, The Dead Beats. Thursday, Bossa Blue. Friday, Jay Collins and the Northern Resistance. Saturday, The Dolly Disco. Sunday, Fireside Brunch with Margie Zins. And Sunday evening, Mr. Roper. Dogwood in Beacon. Also, DogwoodBeacon.com. Tonight, Jeff Jacobs Band. Thursday, DJ Pete Pops. Friday, Chrissy McCullough. And Saturday, The Shrimps. The Falcon in Marlboro and live at thefalcon.com. They're closed for winter break until February 17th, reopening on the 17th with Balin. And Saturday, February 18th with the Alexis P. Suter Band. Fisher Center at Bard College. Info at fishercenter.bard.edu. This Friday, the 27th, The Sound of Spring, a Chinese New Year concert with the orchestra now. Howland Chamber Music Circle at Howland Cultural Center in Beacon. Tickets and info at howlandmusic.org. January 29th, pianist Tzu Wang. Jazz Forum in Tarrytown. Info at jazzformarts.org. Friday and Saturday, two shows each night with Buster Williams. Levon Helm Studios in Woodstock, also levonhelm.com. January 28, The Weight Band. February 4, Midnight Ramble Band. And February 5, Ida. The Stissing Center in Pine Plains, also at the stissingcenter.org. February 11 is Jukebox Junkie. Tarrytown Music Hall in Tarrytown and also at tarrytownmusichall.org. January 26, Jazz is Dead, 25th anniversary celebrating the Grateful Dead. February 11, Mandy Patinkin. Last but never least, Town Crier in Beacon, also towncrier.com. Every Thursday is an open mic. Friday on the salon stage, Dave Keys. Friday on the main stage, Dylan Doyle. Saturday on the salon stage, Petey Hop. And on the main stage Saturday, Gratefully Yours. Sunday brunch with the Lake Trio. Sunday evening with Beacon Song Smiths. And that's what I got. Live and well music is here in the Hudson Valley. I also want to say just another huge thank you to Matt Munisteri, my guest today, for coming in on this snowy, kind of nasty day and spending the hour here on at the station 
and it was a lot of fun. If you missed part of that interview or all of it, or you'd just like to listen to it again, I'll be uploading it tonight to the YouTube channel as well as to the Facebook page. And you can search both out at Local Motion on 91.3 WVKR. If you give a subscribe and a follow, that would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, I know many of you did to listen to that interview. And I'll be back again next week. It's a regular thing here for us every Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. Next week, I'm thrilled to have Stephen Bernstein come back on the show. In two weeks, I'll be celebrating my 350th show here on Local Motion. And my guest will be Rhett Miller. On the 15th of February, Ben Svarin. And on the 22nd, Larry and Teresa are coming back. We've got a great month lined up. We're booked with guests until April. So lots of good stuff going on. So keep up, you know, again, just subscribe to the uh, uh, Facebook page and YouTube channel, and then you'll get to see all the good stuff that's happening here with some amazing guests. And it's always a pleasure. Um so mattmonastery.com, again, he's playing at Birdland with Catherine Russell um, from February, let me get the dates right, February 14th through the 18th, Birdland, New York City with Cat Russell, um, March 10th in Nyack at Maureen's Jazz Cellar, that's him with his music, and also March 11th in Stone Ridge at Lydia's Cafe, and then Matt will also be playing at the Pauling Concert Series with Catherine Russell on March 31st, and Matt's website, you can take a listen, uh, take a look at it, mattmonastery.com, and that is M-U-N-I-S-T-E-R-I. And he's on the socials, too, so you can always follow and keep up and uh, one hell of a guitarist. We're going to go out with one more track of Matt's. It's called The Signifying Rag. And um, let's take a listen to this. This was apparently recorded live in Italy in, back in 2005. And I'll be back next week. Until next time, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And I wish you all peace. Tell me to climb Show me a highway And I'll walk the line Show me you're lovely And I'll show you mine That's called Signifying Tell me you're hungry I'll fish for your den Tell me you're weary I'll tuck you right in Tell me forever I'll send for my kin But you've got to Signify, oh my mind begins to race. Your heart sets the pace. Tell me, is it true or has another's fond embrace wound up in my place? Am I still your number one fool? Paint me a picture and pencil me in. Tell me a story till I tell you when. Say it's forever, I'll send for my kin But you've got to signify Oh, me, oh, you, oh, my
John Kelso. WVKR FM Poughkeepsie, Vassar College Independent Radio since 1971, broadcasting through.